So for the people who just came in, top hat code is uh, 9971, and it's in the chat. We are going to, I guess we'll just go to desktop. Start. All right, so today we will be talking about, um, hold on. Okay. That should work. We'll be talking about uh, three things direct payments for ecosystem services, ecotourism, and half earth. So these are just a couple, just a very few um, conservation solutions that are out there currently um, being tried, et cetera. And switch up here, Let's actually see, okay. Yeah, all right. So if you guys haven't noticed, um, if you're looking at things like direct payments and ecotourism, you're all basically looking at hoping that capital or money is actually gonna sort of influence conservation. And not in the sense that the global North is giving money back to the global South. It's more piecemeal and um, hoping that private individuals will actually give money back through their actions. So direct payments, when we're saying direct payments for ecosystem services, we're saying direct payments for ecosystem services. So this could either be cash in hand or payments in kind. It can be um, just to individuals or it can be to just like local community organizations, like maybe people will pay towards a school or they'll pay um, towards a, uh, what do you call it? Um, like a council of elders or an elder care fund or something like that. And it can have positive economic and ecological impacts. If you bring money into the community, you're obviously gonna have positive impacts on people's livelihoods. And um, if you pay money for certain ecosystem services, like allowing a forest patch to stand instead of turning it into a rice field, um, that ecosystem service could be a uh, carbon requ uh, request requestration, I think, um, sequestration. Uh, but actually, I'm not gonna stop on the, I'm not gonna start on the butt yet. Uh, so one cool uh, way that this could work is I know that a lot of people who work in carnivore human wildlife conflict um, issues, what they'll do is they'll give a landowner the camera trap or something like that, a couple of camera traps that they could put on their land. And for every picture of a puma or a wolf or a jaguar, so I mostly heard about it, about it in Central and South America, but um, for every picture of a jaguar, say, you'll get a certain amount of money, right? And so in that way, the jaguar is sort of earning their keep. Even if, um, for example, the jaguar ends up killing a cattle, a baby, a baby deer or something, a baby cow or something like that. Um, and in those cases, there's usually like a government program also that uh, will take care of um, replacing that individual that was lost to a carnivore. Okay. Now I think we can get into the butt. Um, so the butt in this is uh, if you're bringing in money and you're hoping that this is a long-term thing, the question is where is the money coming from? Um, for a lot of these projects, the money tends to be uh, from organizations, NGOs, or from scientists, if you're thinking about the carnivore conflict and the jaguars. Um, sometimes they'll come from ecotourist operators 
or they'll come from scientists that were able to fundraise enough money to actually put that into place. But the money only lasts for so long when you're thinking about things like that. Then you also have, which is a constant question in everybody's mind, what is the benefit of allowing an animal or a forest patch to remain versus the losses? So what are the pros and cons of doing this action? And do the pros actually outweigh the cons? Um, this is individually variable and it depends on a lot of factors and it can change throughout time. So it's a huge part of the issues that face direct payments. And then you also have the problem of equal distribution of benefits across the community. So if you have just a couple of people um, bordering this forest patch and you decide to pay them to keep up the forest patch for carbon sequestration, um, all the rest of the com other community, the rest of the community doesn't get paid and that can cause tension among uh, individuals. And this is a problem that is like found throughout all these payment programs and these ideas of um, private individuals bringing in money to the community. So for example, through, through tourism, this is a problem that can face all of these programs, this idea of equal distribution of the benefits. So this is just a graph from a paper that looked at this. Well, I actually looked at four different types of um, conservation solutions, um, but I just wanted to focus on payments for ecosystem services on this slide right here. And what we see is that most of the studies and most of the programs that actually have any sort of influence occur in central and upper or northern South America. So the circles widen if you have more outcomes from this program. And I believe this these outcomes can be either positive or negative, but they're not wider because of the number of programs that are there. It could just be one program that's actually causing this wideness. Um, it just happens to be a really good or really um, results driven program. Uh, so we see some are happening in Madagascar and in Eastern Africa, but we're not seeing a lot of outcomes from there. We got some in um, Central Asia, uh, that looks like Southeast Asia, probably. I think that's Borneo, so that's probably, probably um, Vietnam or Thailand or Laos or Cambodia, I think. I'm not really good with geography in Southeast Asia, unfortunately. Um, and this is from the same, pa uh, the same paper. So what we see here is that, like I mentioned, they're comparing four different conservation solutions. We got payments for ecosystem services, community forest management, so a community-based um, conservation solution, uh, certification and reduced impact logging, so certifying the forest, um, I suppose, as a carbon sequestration place, um, say it's a green forest or something like that. And then you also have protected areas. And what they did was that they sort of did a review and a meta-analysis of all the papers that they could find that actually looked at outcomes for each of these um, different types of solutions. And so what we see here is that uh, for economics, um, so giving money directly into the local community, I suppose. Um, we see that there's a lot of beneficial, good, green um, outcomes that occur for certification. And there's also a few good ones for payments for ecosystem services and community forest management. There's not a lot of good ones. So yellow is neutral and red is negative. Um, so we're not seeing a lot of that for protected areas. Then once we move into social, we also see that there's a good mix. Seems like certification has less negative um, effects in the community 
versus uh, say protected areas or ecosystem services, payments in community-based forest management. And then for the environments, we're seeing that there's a lot more benefits, right, in protected areas and in the certification, <clears throat> but there's also a lot of negative and neutral um, outcomes that are occurring in all of these programs. So just to make sure that you guys understand what I'm, what's happening here is that this is all coming from studies that actually um, focused on looking at the outcomes for each of these programs and each of these types of solutions. Um, there's a So I don't know if you guys are really in the literature yet or if you guys have done any research, but um, for the most part, a lot of studies don't actually look at outcomes for certain things. Like I mentioned before, there's not a lot of studies that actually looked at the outcomes for community-based conservation and protected areas, uh, fortress-style fortress -style protected areas. So what we see here is um, this is just a small sample of what they were able to find and of the studies that actually focused on looking at the outcomes of each of these solutions. And then we get to this paper from Ola at all 2019. And so we do see that there is some uh, poverty alleviation that occurs with these payments for ecosystem services, 70% uh, found that there is an alleviation of poverty. 73% um, found that there was a, a, an env environmental outcome, um, whether that was beneficial or negative. I don't quite remember. I think they... Yeah, so this, was, uh, this paper was looking at all the different studies that were actually focused on outcomes as well. And um, the environmental outcome would have been one that uh, people would have focused on in the beginning of the project. And then they would have measured and uh, looked for it at the end or during the program while the payments were actually happening. So yeah, so I'm assuming positive environmental outcomes. Uh, hopefully no one's actually looking for anything negative. Um, so we're seeing that there is a good, it's, it actually works when it does work. Um, but again, there's just not enough studies. It's the same thing as the fortress style and community-based conservation areas. Um, not enough people are actually looking at how these different solutions work and they're actually monitoring um, the impacts of these different solutions as they uh, evolve and grow throughout the years, unfortunately. Does anyone have any questions before I start into ecotourism? I'll have a chat up. Okay. Um, so ecotourism has a pretty basic uh, ideology. So this is an ad from Magical Kenya. Magic awaits. You have, I'm assuming, the Serengeti, um, wide landscapes, wide skies. You got a giraffe and three zebras there. And the idea is uh, protecting nature, entices tourists, and tourists bring money into the local community. Oh, hold up. Okay. So um, I'm not sure. Can anybody who was actually in, I can't remember his name now, David Miller's uh, wildlife management class they usually go through on the fall semester. Um, two years ago, if anybody was in that class, can they raise their hand? Okay. 
I was hoping that there was nobody actually in the class. Um, okay, yeah. So I showed this, I showed this uh, video in a couple of the lectures that I've given on this topic, short lectures. Um, so, but we're gonna, I just wanna make sure that no one had seen it before. Before we get into it. So this is an ecotourism, um, a video about an ecotourist project um, that's occurring in some part of Africa. I've forgotten where, unfortunately, sorry. Uh, but we'll see what the local people have to say about it. And start. Tisha tita itakudaro pa megan u gipo kuti mundo se wa iri wazi wanke nya yenzo ya iba saka pe zaka sonde ne sonzo ento akando zui ibengu ma parana kaka tanga kupera ngenzo. Parika chuzi nzui zanga disinga ya nyikurga magwiri ngu zanga disinga zui kuti. Chinchinuswe, <laughs> Jacob Ripan or me, the Numba Zinagaka Panapa. Kuti Munadoji Minioito, Paka Pinda, a battery in the Nuzumi Kaya. Hara Guma Munuringa Tipa, Sutri Pongo Changa Kubatira, or Gari, and no Fumuaga Ringa and Mapasha, and Juani Kajal, this is Ranu Ganash. Round the month, Pungamunum, with him, when the Western Unga Gumamunum. A gumiri munyumba zedu zizu. Chizenda mupi, mbasha. Chizenda kona, jaa nunga, ishida kuti aone. Chitangu, shaka fana wene jukuti, mirambo, ee, makwasha. Ni mbuka zedu zati nazo. Pinda msangano za kawanda nao. Chuku changa mazano kutia maparano di negosu. Nino kona kuti inga jipi, jati inga shandisa kuti basarili munu muridini. Ateto so guma pako basirwa. Go marine upon a guitar, Duzente Cinco Mili Dora American. Send it in the Cinco, you eat a send it in the Sesh. You end up a battery do Rotara Shan Batan and Naru, what you parochi Patajiri, so good the association, Neko Mikai, the Jesses, Joneke, Sagaita, Numba Dinizaza Pedagogy. You know, eh, Tagasotuti Muku. You know, eh, Tagasotuti Muku. Madojimi <laughs> Ndao <laughs> Shaka Zino Tidakaz Nukuti Zero, Zineta Sukuti, Mano and Dinebar Unukura Chisuzianzo. She may charge and get your kuti. Maturist Anacho Nanzo E. Anenda Konanzo Anu Badar Akuna Kanakurvara, Munimana Kanakunakurvara. And to walk by nine degrees, I wind up on and to Mariani, we then do hospital saka. Zero Shetruko on a good day. Zino bad seed. Go good in so Kiura, I in a mare, so in a mare, Muntanongati da Koyona. And to a petaka set up an inzo can be, and to Montuso Agus is a good day. A reserve for any manji. Inuti inuti ponesa. 
Tinopon and Gutinana, Shinja Panapa, Aripana Pandu, Rush and Gomun. Saka Inda, a shango pregame tourist, a week zona, Mundo, Maguruna, Kona Shango, and Tauno Yakara, she won the Pashi Moon. Saka Takutos Yaguti. Reserve a canaka unity poses to Marguerite to one of it in order. Mabasaiti, no, if you fit in an idu, Russian Panzo Kevan, Master Vent, Maguard. Each a chipiri, Tino Vivere Diriapo, Tinana, and Enda Corimira Vivere Ziani, and Targo Namari. Okay, so like I mentioned, that was a video about an ecotourism project. Um, it sounds like they were speaking French at some point. So I think it must have been in one of the French colonies. Can't remember the country, unfortunately. I'm sorry about that. So I'm going to put you guys into breakout rooms. And now we're going to move to. Uh, we're gonna move to um, what is it? Top hat again. And I want you guys to um, basically, and I hope this doesn't limit y'all's answers. Um, it might, but uh, I want you guys to sort of talk amongst yourselves for five minutes and discuss what you think might be ecotourists, um, ecotourism's um, weakness. And let me make this. Okay. So it looks like you guys got a lot of good points. I'm seeing only sustainable if there are visitors, people are actually coming. Um, so the income might be inconsistent. Uh, looks like put more stress on the wildlife in their daily routines. That is also true. Uh, we got environmental impacts of travel. That's a good point. I never actually thought of that. Um, but yeah, you got people coming in through uh, usually from Europe or Australia or um, United States or Canada and flying to these places can it creates a lot of gas uh eat greenhouse gas emissions we got doesn't address poaching loss of indigenous cultural practices um yeah so i think he got oh effects of invasive species that's a good one too and tourism may damage the environment Okay. Yeah, you guys pretty much got it. Does anyone feel particularly pulled to talk? If not, that's okay. Um, I can just move on. What is this? I think that's okay. I'm just gonna assume that you guys are okay. You guys had really good answers. Um, where is the PowerPoint? <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to share a quick story from um, my experience. Again, uh, I did my master's research work in Madagascar, northeastern Madagascar. And in one of the sites that I did my work, um, there's this species of lemur called a silky shafaka. It's critically endangered. I think uh, the last count was that there's like 300 individuals left in the entire world. Um, and they're only in Northeastern Madagascar. And so WCS wanted to sort of build um, an ecotourist project, ecotourism project, around these individuals, along with all the other cool species um, that Madagascar, Northeastern Madagascar has to offer. There are helmet bongas, there are leaf-tailed geckos, um, 
I know that there's two species, actually, no, there are Vahi, there are sportive lemurs, there are I, I, even though it's easier to see I, I, I think on Far Karena, which is um, not the site. But the problem is that, um, so this is what the travel is like. You gotta go, example, for example, from State College to uh, Antenna Narivo in the capital city of Madagascar, which is actually a really nice capital city. I really enjoyed living there for a bit. Um, but that is like a, that's a day, day's trip. If you go from New York to Antenna Narivo, it takes a lot longer if you go from San Francisco to, um, yeah, if you go from San Francisco and around, you have to stop in um, China, which is a crazy experience. Um, and then you have to like sort of hop, skip everywhere. But you go to Antonio Revo, it's a, at least a day long flight and it sucks. And then you go from Antonio Revo to Maran Setra, which is in the northeast of Madagascar. So you have to get another plane out to um, Maran Setra. And now you're in the northeast, but you're not at the spot yet. So if you want to get to the actual ecotourism site, once you're in Maran Setra, Oh, I, I thought this is a good war thing, by the way. Uh, but either way, you got to take um, you got to take a car or a taxi all the way to a dock that they have right on this river. And basically, you have to go up the river for about six hours, depending on how strong the motor is in the Lakana or the motorized um, boat that they have. So that's six hours up the river. You stop off in a village called Andaparati, which is also a very nice village. Um, the people are really cool and the food's good. But you have to, by then, by that time, it's probably afternoon and it takes hours to hike out to the forest. So you stop off in the village and you're probably sleeping in the community house. Um, it's a very clean house, but they don't have beds in there at least the last time I was there. And um, I don't want to say there are rats, but there is the possibility of rats. Um, then in the morning, next morning, you wake up and you hike through rice fields for a couple of hours, you cross, a river again, um, this time in a smaller canoe. It's just a wood canoe, um, a pirogue as they called it. And then you hike up into the forest on this really steep winding, mo usually muddy unless you go through during the summer um, trail. And me at my best, my complete best fitness, um, it took me three, four hours to do that from village to um, the ecotourism site. Um, if you're not, you if you weren't as fit as I was when I was doing it, it would take you a lot longer. Um, it's very difficult. And then you're finally there. You're finally at the ecotourism site. Um, so, so they're, they're in that huge, rambling story um, is one of the issues, right? So you got to have money to pay for these two flights just to the place um, and back from the place. You have to be able to actually find a place to stay, usually in Maran Setra, because you're not going to go up the river once you actually get to Maran Setra from that flight, because you usually get there in the afternoon. Um, so you have to find a hotel to stay at, which costs more money. And then you have to spend days actually traveling to the ecotourism site, which costs more money. Um, you have to pay for your food. Um, 
you're usually going under your own power. So there's issue of money. There's an issue of infrastructure, right? So even like the really um, popular places in Madagascar. Um, so there's like a, a Fort Dolphin place in southwestern Madagascar. It's got ring-tailed lemurs. Um, there's Ranamafana, which is a huge, um, really popular national park in um, southeastern Madagascar. Um, you got to get there and it takes a long time. And even if you're going by car, the highways are atrocious. Um, so the infrastructure is not really there. And so they created this ecotourism spot like in 2014. And I went back there in 2015. So I was able to check it out. It was actually really, really nice. So when we were doing our research, um, we had we were just camping in like a clearing, uh, which also <laughs> you have to clear the forest, right? You got to clear the forest for lodges. You got to clear the forest for a campsite and you're using wood um, to cook food and to light things when it's dark. So, um, yeah, they had really nice lodges. They had the beds. They had like mosquito nets and they also had a shower. <laughs> which was insane, um, and flushing toilets. Uh, so it was super luxurious for Northeastern Madagascar. But um, when I was there, I was there for two months and the only people who came were these two Australian dudes, um, brothers. And they were there for like a week and then they left. So then it was just me and the Malagasy dudes who were helping me with my research. Um, I don't know if the vis uh, like the visitation rates have picked up. Hopefully they did. Um, obviously COVID will probably have just destroyed that. Um, but the point is that you need money, right? You need the tourists, you need the infrastructure and you also need patience. And for a lot of, a lot of these people um, like I don't know how WCS pitched it to Andaparati and the surrounding villages, but if you're saying that this thing will bring money and, you know, years go by and the rates are low and not a lot of people are coming and they're not getting a lot of money from this project, um, there's going to be an issue there. And um, it's going to burn the community on believing that ecotourism is actually going to be able to help them at all even if another person comes in and happens to have a better track record of making ecotourist projects actually succeed. So in this article right here, um, they were talking about another ecotourism site in Northwestern Africa, uh, Northwestern Madagascar. And I think this was actually pitched by the local people. And I'd have to read it again, but it took them, it took 20 years for the place to like actually get running and get often um, constant tourists coming to visit. So the people in Andaparati and the surrounding villages don't have 20 years to wait for um, this Simpona Eco Lodge, as they call it now, uh, to actually get up and start. And even in, like uh, I said, I went back in 2015, um, they started the Eco Lodge in 2014, late 2014. When I went back and I was doing my camera trap surveys, I saw that there was like fresh habitat clearing, like people were cutting down forests. Um, it was in the trails that were further into the forest, um, probably the trails that tourists wouldn't be able to use um, or wouldn't want to use because it took forever to get into there. But you're seeing even as ecotourism is starting, that people are still having to do what they have to do. Okay, so in this paper, we see that, you know, there's a lot of positive, supposed positive benefits of ecotourism. You got employment and economic diversification, so you don't have to completely depend on one thing. You can um, stop putting your eggs all in one basket. 
and also do some ecotourist stuff on the side. Uh, you have support for conservation initiatives as a positive for environmental, um, the environmental side. And it also increases capacity um, training and um, new skills in the community. So for example, if um, people, if you're gonna do an ecotourism thing like uh, the Sempona Eco Lodge and you want to really focus on the Silky Shafaka and showing people the Silky Shafaka, you need guides that can speak English or French. Usually they can speak, speak French. Madagascar was a French colony, but you do also need people who can also speak English for Americans like me <laughs> that don't know other languages, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, because tourists aren't going to waste time trying to figure out how to speak Malagasy when they could just speak their native language. Um, but there are negative impacts like you guys mentioned or were able to figure out um, income can be inconsistent and it can also be pretty small compared to the livelihoods that they could make just doing what they're usually doing. Um, they're, there's also deforestation occasionally, especially when you're building ecotourist uh, lodges and um, creating new paths that are maybe um, easier for people to walk on but require like clearing down a couple of trees to actually make it work. Um, and as you guys saw, traditions are affected. There's also prostitution. Um, so that was a huge problem in um, Mar et cetera. A lot of uh, tourists came and uh, were basically there just to have sex with um, girls and young women, so. <clears throat> okay, so I already, met, uh, I already mentioned deforestation. Um, it, ecotourism can also be less effective over time. Um, so the effectiveness of the ecotourist project can change over time. It can become better and people hope that it becomes better over time and as more people learn about it. And that happened with that article that I put in the last slide, but um, it can also become less effective. Uh, but again, we get to this point where there's just not enough studies to actually say whether it actually works or not. There's a lot of mixed outcomes and it depends on a lot of different factors. So it's not a silver bullet. It seems like none of these different solutions, fortress style conservation, community-based conservation, payments, um, certification, ecotourism, et cetera, none of these are silver bullets for what's happening. And I did want to mention that when I'm talking about ecotourism, I'm also talking about trophy hunting. Um, I don't have a slide on trophy hunting, but trophy hunting does have a lot of the issues that ecotourism has, um, issues of um, local disempowerments and then also um, money going to only a certain number of people in the community and uh, corruption and it just not working out. And that is without even killing animals. Um, so with the slide, it's just like a slight tangent I want to mention because you can see, um, just like with that video that I just showed, in a lot of the cases, NGOs were the ones or private tour operators that came from the outside were the ones that actually initiated things um, ecotourism projects. We have uh, I think 46 out of 203 cases total where you see that um, the local community actually initiated stuff and the NGOs are just sort of there to help and provide um, support and funding and capacity. So I think that was like 33%, maybe 26%. I want to say 26 or 33% of these cases where the local community actually came up with the idea themselves. Um, so with the video, uh, the dude mentioned that the World Bank provided this money, 200,000 something American dollars. And then um, the charity, the UK charity, MICAI or something like that, provided 106,000 or so. Uh, they didn't provide the money. <laughs> They didn't provide the money. Um, 
I had to look and uh, investigate the charity to understand what was actually happening. But what happened was that the charity came in and they loaned the people the money, the community the money. So they got to pay that money back. Um, hopefully not with interest. I hope not. But uh, they got to pay back one hundred thirteen thousand dollars or so which is a huge amount of money especially for um the global south okay and then a few of you guys mentioned um environmental impacts of recreation and the stress that these uh tourists might have on the wildlife and there are a whole there's like it's a growing um study area research area looking at how recreation actually impacts nature. Um, so this is just an old uh, Manga Bay article. No, no, that's actually a published article, sorry. Um, that's an old article, um, but we're seeing that uh, tourism is causing littering, high traffic and collection of the plants and habitat degradation. We're also seeing that uh, marine tourism, for example, especially when uh, the operators, the tour operators have to feed animals to actually bring them closer so that people can take pictures of them or see them. Um, we're seeing that uh, increases in stress, um, disease transmission, uh, negative interspecific interactions, changes in population and community composition are occurring. And so Bateman and Fleming, I guess they were reading all these papers and they sort of like, I guess were really skeptical about <laughs> what was happening. So they looked at all these uh, different studies and were actually trying to figure out if we were, if people were overstating the negative impact of tourism on wildlife. And um, I just want you guys to focus on this side, the right side of the graph <clears throat> but what we, what we can see here is that if it's on this side of the dot line it's a positive effect and if it's on this side of the dot line it's a negative effect and so we see particularly for physiological responses so for increased stress hormones or um, disease or body condition we see that there's a lot of negative impacts with tourism um, it's a little, a little more mixed as uh, for things like um, activity patterns and other avoidance responses. And then a couple of you guys also mentioned <clears throat> changes in traditions and um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of well, they're not too much actually interest in the idea of ecotourism um, causing local cultures to be a spectacle. So if people travel all the way to um, Northeastern Madagascar and they don't really know anything about Northeastern Madagascar and maybe they're expecting, I don't know, people in grass skirts or something, uh, whatever, um, they're gonna be really shocked <laughs> when they go to Mar etc or even like the more remote villages because people there wear jeans and they wear football jerseys they have radios and televisions they have um cell phones like everybody's got a cell phone um they listen to french and um african pop music they're not what you would expect i guess um a native person to act or look like. Um, and some people get mad about that. Some people don't want to see modern indigenous people acting modern. Um, and some people don't wanna see indigenous people at all. And you guys will hear about that a little bit later. Okay, so let's see. Oh God, Jesus Christ. Um, it's Thursday, damn it. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. 
Uh, okay, so I think I'm gonna play this for you guys and then I'm gonna have to stop it, I guess. And um, I know we ended on having, um, what do you call it? We were talking about um, whoever just came in, uh, attendance code is 3551 and it's also in the chat. But we were also talking, we were talking about um, the couple of conservation solutions that I wanted to show you guys today or on Thursday. Um, and sort of how they worked direct payments, uh, ecotourism, trophy hunting, which is also part of ecotourism. And um, all of them sort of come down to this idea of, you know, making it profitable for conservation to happen. So this was a tweet that I saw come down my timeline um, a couple of weeks ago or a week ago. Yeah, I heard. Um, and I just thought it was relevant. Three, five, five, one. I just thought it was relevant since um, since yeah, so since it seems that people are seem to be hoping that um, private citizens, um, hopefully people with money, will actually pay and enough people will come through and pay and somehow conservation will work that way. And it won't. Um, uh, yeah, so from most of my readings for this class, it seems like um, there's this idea of efficiency and creating and consuming things in an ever more efficient way. And this causes problems, right? So there are some things that you don't want to be efficient. For example, if you're trying to take a break, I mean, you could go drive a car to um, pick up dinner, for example, and you could get there and back in five minutes. But if you wanna think about something or if you just wanna you know, relax while you're going to get dinner, you're gonna walk there even if it takes 20 minutes there and back. So efficiency isn't always the greatest thing. And um, you sort of have to prioritize what you want to be efficient and understand what the costs and benefits of that are. And a lot of the times um, efficiency in consuming and creating sort of wins out over conserving. And, um, and that's the reason why hoping that capitalism or private people with money will actually help conserve things usually won't work. I mean, even Bill Gates, for example, um, he, you know, big philanthropist, he has all those uh, foundations that are giving like tons of money to aid in different countries and um, teaching kids how to code or whatever. Um, scholarships, when I was in high school, I tried to apply for a scholarship from his foundation. But um, even him, he's, you know, he is one of the biggest opponents of the vaccine being freely accessible to um, countries in Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia. So, um, I mean, he could probably afford to get everybody vaccinated. Jeff Bezos could probably afford to get everybody in this world vaccinated, but they just won't do it. All right, so we're gonna move into Half Earth, which is a switch, because they're not talking necessarily about um, money saving the world, I suppose, but they are still kind of, it's still a problematic idea for reasons that I will talk about in a minute, but, Oh, Jesus, I'm trying to shift this thing. Okay, good. Um, so this is a book uh, that sort of started it all. Edward O. Wilson, E.O. Wilson. Um, I mentioned him earlier in uh, this course, I think in the first couple of weeks. He is 
he's one he's uh if not the father one of the fathers of island biogeography which sort of leads us to urban ecology and the idea of habitat fragmentation habitat islands today so he wrote this book um he's an ant person he studies ants and he spent a lot of time in different countries different tropical countries uh studying ants describing ants and um it seems he picked up some conservation ideas along the way, but uh, this is sort of the book that started it all, won a Pulitzer Prize. And we are going to, I showed you guys this video earlier before, but we are gonna see it again, if I can find this thing. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to go to Top Hat and there is going to be a discussion. Do, 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 do. Do, and um, so I'm going to get you guys into breakout rooms. And what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to sort of talk amongst each other and sort of um, Look at the website as well. Uh, it's on there on the discussion question. And I want you guys to take seven, six minutes to um, just discuss amongst yourselves and then reply uh, what you guys noticed about the video and the website. Y'all are saying that's idealistic. It's drawing on emotional connections. Um, very well organized and um, what do you call it? I'm going to say slick, not in a bad way, even though that word has a bad connotation, but it's a very slick, um, what do you call it? Uh, website. It's really nice looking. Um, so we're going to go ahead and I guess we're just going to leave that there. So I'm gonna show you guys what I see. Um, yes, so it does look very slick. It's very, a uh, couple of letters, um, the words <clears throat> aren't too long. Um, they're really easy to read. Uh, going to discover half earth. So it says why half, and it talks about um, why it should be half of the earth that should be protected, um, which half is, looking at advances in technology that allow us to comprehensively map um, the distribution of species. We got a biography on E.O. Wilson, who is from Alabama, and then we got an ad for his book, um, How. So we got, it doesn't look like it's really going into how research. Um, but what I want you guys to focus on really here is um, one of you guys mentioned, or maybe multiple of you guys mentioned, I did not uh, read all of your responses, but um, the mention of the di diversity, inclusion, equity statement, which it seems like all websites have nowadays. But where you really wanna focus on, or where I particularly wanna focus on, is um, we're talking about you know, conserving half of the earth. Um, and for the most part, it looks like tropical areas. Like for example, I don't think you'd see this habitat in Oregon. Um, we have Africa, the continent, pretty highly figured in most of these things. Um, we do have a geo, you know, global span right here, but we have Africa again. And uh, elephants over here. It looks like a bug light, so I can't tell the location of that place. Um, but what I want, really want you guys to focus on here is this Half Earth Council. Um, and these are the thought leaders that are sort of heading up this project, um, which is, it seems more of like a thought project. It's not, it doesn't seem like it's really um, necessarily a call or an actual 
thing that they're going to try and do. It looks like they're trying to shoot for the moon and hoping that they're landing among the stars. But um, these are the people that are sort of heading up this project. And um, we have people that are in charge of mapping and oceans and restoration and population and restoration science communication and uh, the half earth chair, um, human footprints. And we got one person that's uh, in charge of indigenous people. Um, so there's 14 people on this um, council and only Robin Kimmer is indigenous. Um, I'm not sure about them, but most of these people are white. This dude right here, he's a philanthropist. He's um, he's just a billionaire who has a lot of money. Um, and because he had a lot of money, he got to get become in charge of the Gorongosa um, restoration project. Um, Gorongosa, I think that's in Mozambique. And um, I think he, yeah, he's in change. Uh, he's in charge of that national park or natural park, national park uh, because he has so much money um he was able to fund it so that's a whole other can of worms right there but most of these people are white i'm gonna say at least 90 percent of them are white i'm not sure about a couple of them i wasn't able to google everybody but this person for sure she wrote uh sweet grass braiding sweet grass um indigenous wisdom scientific knowledge and the teachings of plants I haven't read it yet. I heard it's a really good book. So if you guys are looking for something like that, you can get it. But she's the only indigenous person on this project. And um, you're looking at mostly tropical imagery in this website. If you want to think about, um, the actual video, um, and I did this, I didn't do this for this class, but it works for this class because that's good. Um, I did this for another project, but I wanted to see what um, what the actual half earth video would look like without all the African imagery, because that was the first thing I noticed. So this is it. Threats to the natural world are multiplying. Coming rate. Unless we move quickly to protect global biodiversity, we will soon lose most of the species composing life. If we conserve half the land and sea, we can still. How do we get there? By mapping up detail and full of our ever changing world, we can identify wildlife corridors and other management solutions that can help sustain biodiversity. With the right information to guide effective world, as well as the people. We can share this precious planet of ours. All life can prosper. So I counted all the time that was spent on this video. Um, I think it's like two minutes and 14 seconds. And 97% or 97 seconds of the video is African imagery. And that's just like uh, imagery that I was like able to see at a glance, it was Africa. So there were some spots in there where it was just showing the ocean, 
or um, E.O. Wilson sitting on a rock, he could have been in Africa at that point. I didn't check because it wasn't a thing that I was really all that focused on. It was just a, um, a whim that I did this, but 97 seconds out of what the 120, 134 seconds of this video have African imagery. Um, so even if they're not saying directly that this is gonna be focused on Africa, the imagery is telling you that um, Africa is the focus or should be the focus. Uh, moving on, okay. So, and to continue with that, what we're seeing is, um, this is another thing I did at a whim. Um, this is information from the World Protected Areas Database. And this is, yeah, it's a graph of um, all the countries in Africa. Um, I think it was like 50 or so that I was able to get. And this is the amount of land, geographic land area um, that is actually protected in each of these countries. So we have about 37% of the countries in Africa have less than 10% um, of their area protected, but most of them have at least uh, 10%. Um, one has over 50%, it's like 64% of their land area is protected, which is insane. Um, and this is just another graph that's showing that. We see all the countries that are laid out in Africa. Um, there's that 64, 63% um, country that has its 63% of its land area protected. Uh, this black bar, this is the United States. The United States has about 11, percent, maybe almost 12 percent of our land area protected. Um, so a good two thirds of Africa, um, the countries in Africa actually have more protected area than the United States. And so I think right here, I made this last week, so forgive me if I get this wrong. Um, I think right here, the average among the sub-Saharan countries in Africa that have uh, protected areas, their average protected area expanse compared to their total expanse is like 18% or something like that. 19, let me see actually, let me look at this. Average is 26%, ooh, nice. <laughs> uh, average is 26%. So if we were gonna, um, if the United States was going to actually uh, protect the average um, land area that is protected in sub-Saharan Africa per country, uh, we would have to take Texas out of commission, California out of commission, I think that's Minnesota out of commission, and even after all those three states, Texas is a huge state. California is a huge state. I'm from it. You cannot drive <laughs> to the south, uh, from the north to the south, like very easily in one day. Um, I guess you could try and do it if you don't stop. And then you also have to throw in Olympic National Park from Washington um, to actually get up to that 26% of protected area. So, I guess the, I guess the reason why I put all that in there is because um, it just it pisses me off <laughs> that uh, um, Africa seems to have a focus in the Half Earth Project in their media, um, and maybe it's just because they have a lot of charismatic megapana, even though we have pumas and bison and wolves and grizzly bears and lynx and stuff like that. But maybe that's the reason, but it just pisses me off that um, Africa is doing much better than a lot of, or much better than the United States. Um, I'm pretty sure the UK as well, if I remember what I was looking at on the database, um, most of Europe, and still there's a focus on Africa, you know, setting aside its area, its land um, to protect biodiversity for the globe. So we are gonna end this, this part of the lecture. Hopefully this works. 
Um, on this video by uh, Dr. Ogata, and we're gonna close this. Uh, first is, well, actually, um, yeah, first, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, so a lot of people wrote a lot of papers when it first came out. It first came out uh, at least last decade. Um, not 2020, but 20, around 2010, probably 2012. And a lot of people wrote papers about it, but um, it's just something that I particularly find offensive to me. So I just want to share with you guys. All right. So um, this is Dr. Mordecai Ogata again. You guys, uh, he was talking Thursday about uh, coronavirus and tourism in Kenya. And this was a conference that the EU had um, this last summer, um, sort of the biodiversity strategy that they wanted to come up with uh, for 2030. And then they had this conference where they sort of called in um, representatives from indigenous people and cultures across the globe. There are people from India, there are people from um, the Congo, which I kind of wanted to show you guys at some point. I'm probably gonna have to show you guys um, in a couple, in a week or so for a different lecture. Um, but uh, this is Dr. Mordecai Agata just talking about this in general, so. Thank you, thank you very much. Is I'm sorry, I just, I find. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. It was really a pleasant. I find, um, I find that idea of people coming to Africa and complaining they saw too many Africans really hilarious. Uh, okay, so we are going to finish up on this real quick. So takeaways, we'll just go ahead and put it like that. All right, takeaways. So, um, there are a ton of different conservation solutions, um, but there aren't that many studies that actually show whether they work. And there's a lot of mixed outcomes and it's all, it often depends on a lot of local factors. Um, and a lot of the focus is on the idea of, as he mentioned, capitalism sort of coming in and saving the day. Um, rich people or people with money coming in to the global south and uh, um, somehow providing a livelihood for local people um, so that they don't encroach upon um, their habitats and stuff like that. So, and we see that that does not necessarily work. Um, Half Earth is a nice idea and it seems at this moment to be sort of like a nice idea kind of thing it's more like a moonshot you know um try and preserve 50 percent of the earth and hopefully you preserve enough that saves biodiversity but it is very problematic problematic in action and um even though they do have one person that's indigenous american indigenous on their council of thought leaders um if you're looking at the kind of land that they're looking to preserve, it seems like uh, they should have a lot more indigenous people in their council at the very least. So now we're gonna switch uh, to environmental racism. 